You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the program where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as from the ever-expanding, ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. If you haven't already done so, listeners, make sure you check out our most recent additions to the network. Of course, I'm talking about Trading Tech Talk as well as Options Playbook Radio, two great shows to really take you deep into the weeds of options. And while we're talking about new additions, make sure you also check out our brand spanking new mobile app, the Options Insider Radio Network mobile app available for iOS, Android, and Amazon, Kindle Fire. No matter what handset, what type of device you have, we have a version for you. You can, of course, instantly stream all of your favorite programs, including all of our coverage from the OIC 2014 conference this year, as well as download those programs for offline listening, even shoot your feedback, your questions directly to the hosts of those programs. So a lot of great stuff. The Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, I think you're going to like it. All right, and joining me on the program today, he's a first-timer on this program, even though he has made an appearance or two on the network in the past. He is Paul Giganti, the Managing Director of Market Structure and Client Advocacy over there at TD Ameritrade. Paul, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Mark. And since this is your first time on our Options Insider radio program, why don't you go ahead and give our listeners a bit of an overview of your background in the space and how you found your way over there to TD Ameritrade. I, I've been in the space for almost 30 years. I started out as an independent market maker at the CBOE, uh, joined Susquehanna in its infancy in uh, 1991, and uh, traded on the floor pretty much doing every function that they had. Left as the uh, manager of the office in Chicago, retired for a couple of years, did a uh, little short stint with NASDAQ as a consultant, and found my way to TD Ameritrade, uh, getting out of the direct trading space, though I happened to trade every day. Uh, and now I really run our market structure uh, portion of the business along with our client advocacy. And what that really means is I, I pay attention to every every rule, regulation, uh, exchange filing, and you know what what the exchanges, the uh, SEC and OCC, and whoever else touches our business, uh, how it's going to affect you. Um, a lot of lot of the uh, legislation coming across, you know, and taxes and that kind of thing is is the really exciting stuff that I cover. And you know, you get the things like uh, the book that was out by uh, uh, by I can't even say his name anymore, um, it, it, talking about uh, the market structure as it is today and how he decided that it was broken. I just, I would be, t- I take an exception to that, and uh, I will I will argue that it's uh, it's never been better for the retail investor certainly and even for the um for the large institutional investor it's, it's just more difficult but you just have to get creative uh, but it is kind of funny how michael lewis has gone almost overnight from in the financial industry from being everyone's pretty much favorite author a hero to a lot of people for his many books like liar's poker to being essentially persona non grata now which is kind of funny how that how that turn happened so quickly. Uh, but we'll get to we'll get to Flash Boys in a minute. Lot to lot to obviously dive into there, particularly from your perspective as the guy who who watches over retail over there. But it has been a while since we've checked in with what's been going on over there at TD Ameritrade. I think it's probably been a couple of years now. So maybe we'll start there. Why don't you give us a bit of an update, a rundown, and some of the more recent top of mind developments and issues you guys are working on over there at TD Ameritrade from an options perspective. 
From an options perspective, I, I can speak most to the uh, Think or Swim group because that's where I, I spend my days is in the office there. Uh, so in the Think or Swim group, it's just constant evolution of uh, the, the trading technology, both from the mobile apps on, on all the different devices that are in the constant uh, upgrading uh, mode to the Thinkorswim, you know, main platform and Trade Architect also, that both have, have had, you know, amazing growth. And I'll go, I'll, I'll tell you my, just my favorite uh, feature in uh, Thinkorswim's platform that's out there that really, uh, I think we undersell it within our walls. And if you look at my trading account, you can see that I've got it set up on every one of our, my uh, trades. It's a, an automatic roller of a strategy. So it's a strategy roller that you can pick, you can make it, you know, go to the default settings and have it just roll every, you know, I think it, it, it's default settings every Wednesday um, uh, before expiration and, and you will roll your buy right. And then generally I have buy rights on, so I will roll my buy, buy right and you can pick the strike, and you, but you can get real granular on it and decide it's, I want to have this thing be a mid-market at 11 o'clock in the morning and by 3 o'clock I want, want to be able to uh, have it take the offer or hit the bid, you know, depending on the, the strategy you're doing. And so you can have it, it slide, you know, one, slide with the market over time. You can have it stay static. You, you can really do a bunch of things. It sounds complicated. It's just check boxes and slide, uh, uh, sliders on your uh, keyboard. It's, it's simple. It's, and, you, you know, you set it and you can forget it. And, you know, if, if you believe that, you know, that the buy right index is correct and it outperforms the marketplace uh, year after year, uh, and particularly, you know, you can look at it at the buy right index that the SIBO has put out that you've really, you are in the driver's seat if you do this thing. If you set it and forget it, you're, you're really going to be happy in the long run. You're going to have, you know, dampen your risk a little bit and, uh, and you collect some premiums and, you know, it's really making a non-dividend stock or any dividend stock into a greater dividend stock is the way I look at it. So, you know, like to me, we haven't pushed it that hard um, or it doesn't feel like we have. And, into, and it's it, it's very intuitive. It's, br it's a brilliant idea. So I, I like I'd say you have undersold it because I wasn't even aware of it until you told me about it just now. And I, I played around with your platform a bit. So that, that is kind of interesting. But you're right. That is ideally suited tool for the use case you described, like the buy rights. And I think for a lot of the retail public, as well as for, I think, a growing number of financial advisors who are growing and starting to dabble in options, that sort of tool really takes away one of their main complaints, one of their main stumbling blocks for options. I don't have time to roll my covered calls every week or every quarter or whatever the case may be. Something like that, you can maybe set your out-of-the-money percentage, set whatever time you want to do it. So you want to roll your 5% out-of-the-money call every week. That sounds like something that would take a lot of the hassle away for those guys. Well, and, and, and now that we have 52 expirations a year, like to me, this is this is real magic. You get to get the the real theta in your favor every week, and you can roll it Friday afternoons at you know two fifty five if you want in your Chicago time. But um, if you want, so it's it's really like to me, it's it's a it's just a fantastic tool that's that's out there that that gives you the, the ability to win and win over time. What are interesting tools are you guys cooking up over there at TD Ameritrade and at Thinkorswim? Um, you know, the we're just we're trying to we put a bunch of new studies in on our um, with our platform, meaning uh, for charting. And so it, it, it for for chart people that that chart uh, it, you can get very granular. You can uh, zoom in on things. You can uh, change you know all the parameters on a on a regular basis. You go to percentage terms. Uh, it's it's just it's a great platform for that. I don't happen to trade that way. So and since I'm in the market structure world, I don't I don't uh, really sell the platform that often. So you know I'm I'm talking about things that I use. You know so that's why I know them well. Uh, the charting things I don't, I don't follow charts too much, but I know that's something that we spend a lot of time working on. Uh, speaking of your platform and talking about the advisor audience, we were just talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm starting to hear more. As we do a lot, obviously, in that space, we have our advisors option program where we speak a lot directly to that audience. And I'm starting to hear a lot more as those advisors are getting into the space, becoming more familiar with options, that a lot of them are turning to your stuff and to the think pipes as kind of the a de facto platform for their, their use case, which it interests me and surprises me because I know you guys do a lot with the high-end retail. 
and yet it seems like with the dissolution over there at Brokers Express and not too many other players out in that area, you guys are kind of becoming the the choice for a lot of those type players. Does that surprise you? Or is that business you guys are, are actively pursuing? Oh, it's business we're absolutely pursuing. And it's it's a great offering of ours. And it's an offering that we've uh, we've just committed to put a, a lot more uh, manpower and woman power into uh, making it a better uh, a better platform using a lot of the feedback we've, we've had from our existing advisors. I mean, our our advisor, um, Assets Under Management, is over, is, I don't remember, it, it's somewhere around uh, 40% of our, our uh, total assets under management, Some somewhere in that uh, that area. So it's, it's a big number. And so uh, our advisors are, you know, extremely important to us. And, and our advisor network Using options is important to us. We, uh, one of the gentlemen on our um, on our desk that runs the options portion of, of our Think Pipes, uh, Scott Schneider, is a former floor trader in Chicago. That stood next to him in a bunch of different pits. Fantastic floor trader, even a better businessman. He's really he's under, he's a great teacher of our advisors on how to use options as an advisor, and made 100% year over year growth within the advisory advisor space using options. So he he understands and he's evangelical about his his views and how options should be used with uh, from a money manager and gives you know he doesn't give advice but he gives you know tools to the advisors in order to really use uh, put strategies into play for their um, for their clients. You know, one of the most common complaints we hear from that audience is that the firms they work with that onboard their funds don't understand options. They don't give them any good tools or account management systems. A lot of these guys, you'd be amazed. They have hundreds of millions of dollars, the AUM, and they're still writing covered calls and tracking everything in an Excel spreadsheet because the tools they get from their system and their providers are just atrocious. So if the fact that you guys can offer them tools that, that approximate the level of functionality that a high-end retail guy can get coming to your system, I think that's very attractive for them. And I think it can help bring more advisors into the fold too, which I think both you and I will agree is a good thing. So many of these guys are sitting on long only equity funds and aren't even buying protective puts or writing calls or things like that, things that they of course should be doing. So the more you can put good tools in front of them, like your automatic roller tool there to help bring them into the fold, I think it's a beneficial thing for everybody involved. Yeah, I would love to see, I mean, you know, we're here we are at the options conference. I would love to see advisors come down as in really see what what's out there and what we have to offer you know i'm proud of the industry i think we've done a great job growing up and you know knock on wood a little bit you know yeah we the amex has had an issue this week but the, you know it was it was dealt with everybody's going to have an issue whoever runs electronics of any kind and um but the rules are in place everything's in place to make it a safer better environment the you know the markets really have never been better pretty much for any kind of type of player so the fact that we can now reach into the advisor space and and give them tools that will make them more successful uh, is something that we really have to get out there as an industry and get them involved in decision making by coming to, to places like this this conference because they they can then understand and see what we have um, uh, what we have to offer them and they can have a, a seat at the table and they'd be welcome to pretty much any table in deciding uh, what what the industry needs to evolve to to make them more successful. You mentioned uh, the big error that, that went down over there at NYSE this week. I think they had a bust close to half a million contracts. So from a, a pure contract size perspective, it was a pretty substantial error. Focusing on that for a second, because you are the market structure guy over there. You've worked at an exchange in the past. You have a bit of a unique perspective on this. You know, we're seeing this dramatic expansion in the number of trading venues we're seeing in the option space. We're up to a dozen now. There's more coming down the pike uh, any day now, it seems like. Everyone's threatening to launch second and third exchanges under their umbrellas. Uh, that, of course, means multiple venues people have to connect to, multiple technological systems they have to work with, multiple fee schedules, everything else like that. And you know, as you add more layers of complexity, it adds more potential points of failure in the system. And I'm, I'm curious now, as your new role there, as, the, as working with a lot of the retail audience, do you think this growing layer of complexity, this, this very Byzantine structure we've created in the exchange world is really contributing to the increasing frequency of these errors we're seeing? I mean, with this error this week, but of course, there were a number of very high profile failures in 2013, some that led to the downfall of night and others. And it seems to be increasing frequency of errors. Do you think this exchange structure we have in front of us is really a, a driving force of that? And as someone who watches out for the retail, would you like to maybe see 
the industry put a bit of a, a break on the expansion until they could figure out all their systems a little bit better? Or is that something that doesn't really concern you? You know, it. I, I, I'll go back to, I was at a panel a few months ago, and, and the guy sitting next to me had had the best line I've, I've heard of. Hey, do you remember December 5th? And this is really an equity and not an options issue. But in, I said, no, you know, December, I think, 9th was the day that they started printing to the tape odd lots. And he goes, yeah, that's a good thing. New York Stock Exchange had, had a glitch. They lost one of, the, one of their servers, hardware crashed, the failover didn't work. They lost some uh, part of the alphabet. They weren't able to quote. Nobody, nobody knew. Why? Because we do have such great fragmentation. You know, fragmentation is, is, is kind of a double-edged sword. People like to, like to talk about the, the bad parts of fragmentation, that they have to hook up to all these venues and it's expensive, and certainly that's true, and, the, and I'll get into the answer for that in a, while, in a few minutes, but the fragmentation works in most of the time in investors' favor, and um, the market will seek the right level. For the, for the amount of fragmentation. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I thought one options exchange when I was trading on the CBO was, was just about the right <laughs> that number. That was ideal, yes. Yeah, yeah, because my market was two and a quarter, three quarters, yes, and yes. I was pretty darn happy buying on the bid, selling the offer. Unfortunately, that didn't create a lot of business. And, you know, now when we did, you know, a couple hundred contracts a day, we were absolutely thrilled. Now, if you did a couple hundred contracts a day, you're a semi active retail. So uh, it's not, you know, the world's changed. Technology's made it a lot better for every one of us as investors. But what we have to look at now is, is the market structure as a whole. The market structure as a whole, the barriers to entry to be an exchange are probably too low. Now, what, what barriers do you put up to make it, to make a change? You have to be really careful about. So I, I, I would rather have there be too many exchanges and, and uh, everyone have... The, what, what you get too easily is to have a protected quote. So my, my thought is in, in, uh, that in order to protect that quote, to be part of the NBBO, you need to, to have some resiliencies and hurdles and everything. And so I think that what is, what is likely to happen is uh, we're going to have a regulation because of because we're putting seat belts in every every one of our cars and we're we're putting airbags in and we're making all that you can't make a real cheap car anymore because there's you know ten thousand dollars in uh, in safety uh, equipment that's in every car and it's kind of the same thing with an options exchange or an equity exchange you're going to have you're going to have people say I can't really add much more you can add new venues and new venues are just a plug in but you're not going to have many new my axes coming online and I would think that you know even some of the smaller exchanges are going to run into problems carrying the weight of all that unless they have a parent company or they can get some critical mass by creating a better mousetrap I mean right now there's there's a you know 10 different you know you know, there's five different real, really kind of nuanced models that are out there that are spread between a dozen exchanges uh, in the options world. I think that as we get, as we get more um, competitive, you're going to have to you have to prove yourself in the world. You know, we we see, we've seen this idea on the equity side that there's a new uh, a new equity uh, dark puddle that's ex that's that's doing their. Uh, that's slowing down the marketplace, and they think that that's the answer. It's great. I love the idea that there's a there's a new a new idea out there in order to change market structure, uh, and if it works, fantastic. Everybody will copy them, and then we'll have a, a, we'll, the market forces will force everybody to do this and do it better, and it will it will be better. If not, it's just another choice that people can make, as there are in equity options exchanges. So. So very long-winded answer of saying, you know, I don't know if there's a, I don't think that there's a, the right number. I think market forces will 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 make it, and I think that this what's probably going to drive some consolidation or some uh, uh, damper on the growth of, of of venues. And I don't think venues is an issue, but uh, uh, venues is going to be the cost of regulation and uh, safety mechanisms. I think we're going to look at back at this period of time in ten years. And say, I can't believe we had exchanges that didn't have, you know, didn't have kill switches or didn't have uh, ability to uh, to know, you know, your, your net notional is over a certain threshold, and and you could actually blow up the entire industry without because you're you're going a million miles an hour and no safety nets. I mean, it's really I look back at what we had ten years ago when I was in, the, in trading at Susquehanna, and we had a glitch that that kind of blew up our system that that really. Um, that impacted the SIBO system for you know a couple minutes. You know it wasn't you know it was expensive for us and it was a pain in the neck and it was impactful for the SIBO and we all learned. But 
we learn to put in more safety mechanisms. Each one of these, these glitches that we see uncovers a new way to do it. Now what we're going to have to do is we're, we're going to have to know that these, these problems happen, but what we're going to re really have to do is know what to do when they happen, because they're going to happen. And, you know, we've, we've seen it. It's going to we just have to have processes in place where every exchange knows to pick up the phone and call to a central location. This is when we had the problem. You cut me off here. This is the exact time. Or the SIP goes down. We all cut off exactly at 10.15.01, and 10.15.01 it all happened. So those are the kind of things that we're all learning because we look back on, on how what a mess it was to un unravel these things. And, you know, we've been fortunate so far that they've been able to be unraveled without really putting anybody out of business other than the night capital issue. And, and you know, that was more of a self-inflicted, but it's self-inflicted, but you still would like, like it not to be that way that you can blow yourself up. Since you are uh, very much active in the retail space these days, are you seeing any traction on this stuff from the retail audience? Are they concerned about this? Are they calling up at, at Thinkorswim and TD and saying, hey, I'm concerned about these errors? Or is this not really top of mind for them at all, and we're kind of blowing a lot of smoke here about nothing? Well, you know, I think it's important that we blow a lot of smoke about nothing, uh, or that, 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 and it is nothing. It, it appears to be nothing for the retail. What the retail, what I think we've we've learned from it, from the retail side, is they entrust TD Ameritrade, Scott Trade, E Trade, you know, the rest of the retail brokers to uh, work for them, and the, they know in somewhere they know that we're all in the room fighting for them. So they they trust us. They sleep at night saying, "Okay, I've got my army of guys that you know and gals that are taking care of of the uh, market structure and everything's going to be okay." Um, why do I think that? Because in this last few weeks, you know, the month or so that um, that it's been a, a top of mind for everybody in the industry, it it was 001 percent of our uh, help desk calls had to do with market structure or um, or anything to do with the uh, new dark puddle. That's out there. <laughs> so retail still, even your clientele, which focuses a lot on the high end of the retail, not too concerned about that, which I suppose is a good thing. That, you means, know, they, that means they're I, active and still trading and not concerned themselves with these other issues. They, they've asked, you know, we've had, you know, intelligent questions about it. I, I think that um, that they, you know, we did a survey and 92% uh, of our clients, of, not all our, our clients, of retail clients, uh, this is a survey in January, so it's a little dated, but... Uh, asked whether they trust the market structure today, and and um, and 92 percent of them said they were positive to neutral to positive on on what happens to their order when it leaves their their hands. It's interesting you said that, that was January because I wonder if you did that survey now. It might be a little bit different. We are of course uh, recording this in the wake of the tsunami of hype around the Flash Boys book. You touched on a little bit at the top of the show. I'd imagine those numbers might dip a little bit right now, given just all of the sturm and drang around the markets being rigged. I have a feeling I know what you're going to say about the book and what your feelings might be, Paul, but what is your take, your 10,000-foot perspective on Flash Boys and some of the criticisms he levels in that book? Uh, I, I think, you know, I think it's a great fictional read. Um, it's a, um, you know, I, I if I could... You know, take my emotions out of it. I thought it was a, uh, you know, entertaining book. Uh, you know, I know all the characters in here. I actually, personally, like every, you know, pretty much every one of the guys in the book. Um, but uh, you know, I think it kind of ends there. I don't think anybody's got the answer for the marketplace. Um, I would, uh, you know, we were talking about you know, the idea on 60 Minutes of this, you know, uh, Thor, the delay in the quote going out to the market. Uh, to certain market uh, destinations and, uh, you know, having a queue line for where you're going to end up so you can get your better fill rate. Um, I, you know, I'm not being modest here. I'm certainly not the brightest guy in the in the options industry, but I was very, very aware of how to send an order to different locations at different speeds in 2004 and five. So if I were a customer of, of the owners of Thor, uh, the RBC, the RBC right? guys, um, I would uh, I'd question... I'd question why they didn't know. It just seems like one of those questions, you know, one of those things I, I would I would challenge to ask because it was a pretty well known. And it, it, you know, I I see it as not a. It's a. Um, it's just knowing the markets. I don't think it's anything that nefarious going on out there. I think that uh, they will evolve and they're pushing it out. I mean, I think market forces will force them to be efficient and 
and develop things like Thor and people with, uh, and I don't think that that's gaming. I don't think that it's a problem. I think that uh, the race for speed is okay because we know where it ends. It ends at the speed of light. And the closer you get, I think uh, Manoj uh, Narang from um, uh, Tradeworks has been a fantastic uh, voice in this, in this, in, you know, I sound like an apologist for high frequency, and in a way I am because they've done an incredible job of tightening up the markets for uh, retail investors. And that's the odd thing, and I think probably the the main disservice coming out of the book is that I think it probably will impact those retail confidence numbers when it really shouldn't. They're probably, of all the different cases cited in the book and all the different use cases, all of those are involving big institutional players. There's not a single example in the book of your proverbial grandmother from Iowa buying 100 shares of IBM or a 10 lot of options and being front run by a gecko or a citadel. That's just not happening. In fact, they're, they're filling those people. And that's where a lot of those fills are coming from. So I think it's probably pretty demonstrable that those people are getting better executions as a result. But I'm sure guys like you going forward when you run your next surveys are going to be feeling some of the impact of the post Flash Boy hype yeah and and you know I, I want yeah that's absolutely true we'll see we'll see that but I, I want to make sure that I am not saying that the IEX model is not a good model I, I think that it's a it's an attractive you know it's an attractive thing thing to try as everything and you know we're you know we are willing you know we've talked to them we're continuing our talks with them it's not something that that is out of um, that's it my, my feelings about the book and about the the hype that comes with it is more that it's it's hurting investor confidence in a place that it shouldn't. I don't think that, you know, I think I completely agree agree that the investors have never had it better in the option space and the equity space too. If uh, the uh, retail uh, segment certainly, uh, our CEO from TD Ameritrade, Fred Chomzak, has been out and talking quite a bit about it. Uh, he's very involved in the market structure debate. Uh, helps. He's helping drive our our positions on it. Uh, he is um, he is as much involved in it as anyone. Um, so, you know, we take you know we as a firm take it very seriously, and we want to make sure that it that it is good for our clients. And that's um, you know it's it's a it's it's something that we want to make sure that uh, people know that we're on watch. Do you think there's room for an IDX type model in the option space? I've heard different people over the years propose variations on that theme to me, an exchange solely focused on retail without the payment, some of the other issues that are going on at other exchanges, a venue solely focused on that execution for that type of clientele. Clearly, that would cater to your type of clientele as well. You think there's interest in that from that community or think that kind of venue is just the options market isn't ready for that? Oh, I think the options market is ready for any good idea. And and if you could paint, if you could uh, create an exchange that is a new way to look at things that, that caters better to our clientele, there is zero doubt that we'd be there. You know, there is, um, you know, there's there's other things that go with the ex- exchange model now that that are good for us that would have to be ported over to that. So we want to have all the the positives. I want to have somebody stand up for my order. I want somebody making sure that my errors are resolved. I want to, it, it done quickly and. I want to be able to see, you know, see the real depth, you know, all the things that. So if you could port that over into a new exchange model that, that caters to me, it sounds perfect. Like, sure. Great. It's just, you know, let's make sure that we don't lose anything in the, in the way. And that's what I've been fighting for on the equity side, too. Yeah, that's probably the downside of something like that in the option space. And you're probably going to see that in the equity space as well with IDX. I haven't checked their volume or their spreads on anything, but I'd imagine on the options version of that, it would be a little bit lighter. The spreads would probably be wider because a lot less firms wouldn't be playing on that space. It might be an interesting case study, if nothing else, for the retail guys who are concerned about this. They could say, I want to go trade at this venue that doesn't accept payment, doesn't have all this other HFT stuff going on. And as a result, I'm paying maybe this demonstrably wider spread versus some of these other exchanges that could be tighter. So that might be an interesting use case for them to see exactly how things are transpiring and where the costs are actually lining up for them. If they want to make that conscious choice to pay a little bit extra wider spread for whatever reason they feel they're being front run or whatever the case may be, they can do that. That might be an interesting use case for the industry to say, hey, look, here's what happens when you do this. Yeah, I mean, I know on the equity side, and you know, I hate to keep bouncing to that side, but if we're looking for them for guidance. That is the focus of Flash Boys yeah, as well. Um, is, you know, you look at Bank America, it's a penny wide. If you go into our platform or any other platform, you know, most of our competitors, you're going to never be able to pay the offer or sell the bid because you're going to do better than that. It's hard for me to believe in a penny wide spread when you're getting, you know, some price improvement on both sides, either way, all day that, 
anybody's front running, anybody's doing anything nefarious that's hurting you um, when you're buying your thousand shares. Even in some, you know, some of the lower tiers, less uh, liquid stocks, you're still going to get, you know, as we've done the done the research, and I actually ran into one of my colleagues from one of the other, from one of our competitors, had exactly the same number. Then we get four times the liquidity that's shown on the screens because of the consolidators that we use. If you're going to go out there to a place that's not not uh, that's not supported by, you know, some form of uh, people will call a lot of market makers HFT, some form of, of that, you're not, likely to not do nearly as well. But, you know, the market will tell you if that's better. And so on the equity side, if, you know, the IEX form of, of it works, like I said, everybody in the world is going to copy it. That's the beauty of the U.S. market. It's not a patented, I don't think it's a patented um, procedure going into their, I'm sure there are some patents involved, but people will be able to slow it down and probably, you know, this was the first swipe at it. The first swipe is unlikely to be the best one. So somebody else will come build on it. They'll build on it themselves and it's going to, it's going to evolve into something. If it's the right idea, it'll, it'll work by itself, but there's going to be no, no amount of coercion or, or push or media hype is going to make some money manager go someplace that doesn't do, that's going to make his, uh, his numbers go down at the end of the year for his clients. It's all about that quote on the screen at the end of the day and what they can get filled uh, on that quote. Let's shift gears a little bit. Michael Lewis has had his day in the sun. We don't need to uh, continue giving him some publicity here, but uh, let's shift gears to the product side of the option space. I think you undersold your history in the space a little bit because you helped and your time at NASDAQ to shepherd one of the more intriguing new products I've seen in the space. And of course, the alpha indices is what I'm talking about. You had Apple versus SPY and other types of interesting contrasting products. Uh, unfortunately, we at the Options Insider and our Option Blog program are pretty much uh, the only outlet that really seemed to, to get the the value inherent in those products. And a NASDAQ, I've said this to them many times, they really dropped the ball from a promotional standpoint with those products. I think there's a lot of value to be had there. And for whatever reason, uh, it didn't really catch on. But talking about some other failed retail-oriented products... We're meeting here at the OIC 2014 conference. Two years ago at this conference, the big talk here from everybody, exchange heads, trading firms, everyone that had to do with retail was the minis. Minis were going to come along. Minis were going to solve every problem the retail space had. If you had a 30 lot of Apple, you can now ride covered calls. The world was your oyster. Everything was fantastic. They launched a little over a year ago. And let's just say they haven't really lit up the tape since then. They're averaging, I think, total on a good day, around 11,000 contracts across all the classes. And usually, divide that by 10, of course, not a ton of actual volume there. And that's on a good day. So I'm curious to you, this product was aimed squarely at your clientele. Why do you think the minis haven't caught on? You know, I don't. The, the bottom line is I don't know. Um, it, I was... I was as far into the camp that these things are going to succeed as anyone. I, 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 lo I looked at them and I thought, this is a great way for people to dabble in options, have a P&L associated with if you're tired of playing on the um, paper money or the, you know, the trial, paper trading, paper trading we call it paper money at, at Thinkorswim, uh, at the paper trading um, concept and you want to put real dollars in and see what it felt like. And so you make rational decisions. Or, or irrational decisions that are forced into it by, by you know, losing too much or, you know, oh, I can't stand taking this, you know, riding this winter too long. So I, I thought that that would be the clientele that you're going to get. And I don't know, you know, maybe maybe it's a bit of um, underselling to the clients. You know, it's, it's generally that that does it. It's so many Apple traders, 52% of our, our Apple um, volume was odd lots. Uh, so you thought, well, okay, if we're... That's, that's a no-brainer. Hey, it's a no-brainer. you got to give these things a try. Um, as I, you know, I was real positive on weeklies when they came out. I thought that would be the, you know, 52 expirations a year, bring Theta home every every week. That sounds like a you know, the home run. I thought that this was another one that was right up there with that home run. And, you know, maybe they're priced wrong um, from from the from the houses. But I actually, you know, had have heard no nobody complain about anything really to do with them probably just i don't know if they don't know if they're there or they're just not a not a product that's caught on um you know i know now with apple split it's kind of a moot point there you got the um got the google you know still well over a thousand or no actually now that's split to 500 but you're still you're at a, quite a big notional you know round lot's going to cost you fifty thousand dollars um that's a big number you know, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have an answer for you. I, I, w I wish I did. I think that the, you know, I really think they're the right product. 
it seemed like a lot of people dropped the ball when it, and it came to the minis. The exchanges, a lot of them still tried to pass on full exchange fees. Some of them have since reduced that. A lot of the complaints we have heard from the retail on that side is that a lot of their brokers still charged full freight, so full ticket charge, full regular commission. And, you know, retail isn't stupid. They know they're trading a one-tenth size contract. They expect some sort of commission break there. A lot of firms, I'm not sure how TD priced them. Did you price them on a, as a regular option contract as well? You know, I'm not sure. I think we did. And, and, you know, I remember the debate going on both at the exchange level because I sit on the uh, advisory board at the CBO and the Amex um, uh, options board. And uh, I know the debate at the exchange level was, you know, we have still have to do the same amount of work for these things. And we're, uh, if you trade a $700 Apple or six, $550 Apple or a $50 Apple, it's still the same, you know, it, it, it one lot still one lot. You know whether it's a five hundred dollars stock or a fifty lot dollar stock. Why are we going to all of a sudden give you know turn this five hundred dollars stock into a fifty dollars stock and give you a ten, you know one tenth price? It's kind of it, it, I know it's kind of a silly silly thought, but you know if we're going to you know commission by uh, notional of the stock, we're going to have a really messy commission. So I, I don't know I don't know what the right answer was. I just know that. Uh, it must have been wrong. Yes, <laughs> oh, I think that's probably the only <laughs> answer. Whatever everyone chose was wrong because apparently no one really uh, really gravitated toward them. Liquidity providers also surprisingly didn't really gravitate toward them. That was probably the biggest surprise for me. I thought this would be a home run. So many of them are so focused on Apple these days. Apple was very much the test case for these products. Uh, even still today, if you look at them, the markets are, I think drive a truck through them is charitable. They're atrocious. If you're going to trade these things, you have to pay full freight and pay whatever spread, you have to really want to trade these things at this point. Yeah, and which is crazy because as a former liquidity provider uh, or reformed liquidity provider, maybe, <laughs> um, you know, it really, you look at it and you're, you know, you're driving the same quote. It's just as easy. You're not going to get run over on your Apple quotes. Maybe you're talking about bandwidth issues. You know, they, you know, maybe it slows down your processor if you're trying to throw them out there on a fast-moving stock on so many different series and now you're doubling the series because you have minis. Potentially, that that is it. You know, I'm trying to make excuses for why people aren't doing it. I I truly don't know. Have you had a chance to chat with any of your old buddies at Susquehanna? I talked to a lot of different liquidity providers. I haven't really received any good answers as to why you wouldn't be close to at least as tight in an Apple Mini as you would be in the main product. Because I, I have never heard of a good good answer. I have not asked them. I. I'm, I'm certain I would get the same shrug of the shoulders that I'm giving right now. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like, too, like you mentioned this Apple stock split. Uh, that probably is going to be, I'd imagine, the nail in the coffin for a lot of minis going forward. That was the test case. That was the premier launch product of the minis with Apple going seven for one. It kind of obviates the need for minis going forward. Maybe you have a different viewpoint. It doesn't sound like you do, but that sounds like minis are kind of uh, circling the drain right now, which is an unfortunate, <laughs> yeah. unfortunate thing. Uh, well, Paul, I'm glad we can get you on. I'm glad we can finally get a chance to uh, check back in with what's cooking over there at TD as well as Think or Swim. And before we go, any last tidbits you want to leave our listeners with? Any hints or teases of things coming down the pike they may want to pay attention to over there at TD or Think or Swim? You know, I, I wish I had a good answer for you. Uh, I don't. You know, when you have uh, you have JJ on or or one of the or, uh, Q, a couple of the guys I work with, they drive the platforms. So they'll give you the the great uh, great what's coming down the pike for you. I'm glad we can have you on. We'll have to check back in on a more frequent basis uh, with you guys going forward. All right, thanks so much, Mark. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 